Hello and welcome to Easter Egg Hunting, a show that dissects your favorite games looking for hidden secrets and Easter eggs. We're gonna try our hardest to show you any and all Easter eggs that we can find in any game, and we'll even be throwing in a bit of trivia as well. This time, we're gonna be covering everyone's favorite video game plumber that rarely does any plumbing, Mario. Up to this date, the amount of games that this little guy has starred in is now over 200, and so we won't be physically or mentally able to cover every single game he has been in. Instead, we'll be focusing mainly on his main series, Mario titles, which I'm sure will be the ones that everyone recognizes and remembers the most. We have a lot of games to cover and a lot of secrets to find, so let's not waste any more time and jump straight in. Jumping into Super Mario Bros. 1 on the NES, let's get this one out of the way quickly. The clouds and the bushes actually use the same graphic. They're the same graphic with a different palette loaded into each object, and this was likely done to save space on the game's cartridge. If you walk a little further and hit the question block, a super mushroom will pop out. These mushrooms are actually based on real-life mushrooms called Amanita muscaria. Amanita muscaria are quite dangerous. When consumed, they can cause individuals to experience visual distortions that make it seem like objects around the individual are changing in size, or that they themselves are growing or shrinking. Amanita muscaria are also thought to have influenced parts of Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And just as a side note here, the mushroom enemy Amanita from Super Mario RPG for the SNES are also named after this type of mushroom, possibly as a reference to their poisonous origin. There's also a little secret within the mushroom power-up sound effect. It's a very similar tune to what plays after jumping on a flagpole and finishing a level, only massively sped up. Here, we've slowed the jingle down to 20% of its in-game speed. The jingle is missing the last sequence of notes from the level complete melody, but the overall chord progression is the same even though the arpeggiated notes are arranged differently. It's interesting that the slowed down sound effect has a melody that shares a thematic connection with the end of the level theme, even though nobody would ever notice it in normal gameplay. It's possible that this sound effect was literally a segment of the flagpole theme sped up in order to save space in a similar way to the cloud and bush graphics mentioned earlier. Speaking of the flagpoles, by using a glitch that's referred to by the fans as walking the turtle, it's possible to jump over the flag at the end of several levels in the game. The glitch in involves trapping a Koopa Trooper in a pit and then following it and using its glitched state to double jump before hitting the flagpole. In World 3-3 specifically, you can easily jump over the flagpole without this Koopa Trooper glitch. Disappointingly, there's nothing behind the flagpoles besides infinitely looping space. One detail that a lot of people overlook is that the Bowsers in the castles of World 1-7 through 7 are just common enemies disguised as Bowser. You can actually reveal the disguise by killing Bowser with fireballs. These enemies are actually identified as false Bowsers, and Super Mario 3D Land for the 3DS features similarly disguised enemies pretending to be their leader by use of a raccoon leaf, in reference to the first NES Super Mario Bros. In order of appearance from Castle 1 to 7, the false Bowsers are a Goomba, a Green Koopa Trooper, a Buzzy Beetle, a Spiny, a Lakitu, a Blooper, and finally a Hammer Brother in disguise. And speaking of Hammer Brothers, if you encounter a Hammer Brother and wait for a while out of its range, it'll eventually start chasing you down. There's also a fairly famous glitch in the game referred to as the Minus World glitch. If you glitch yourself through the wall in World 1-2 and go down the first warp pipe, you'll end up at World Minus 1, the Minus World. It's an underwater level that's exactly like World 7-2 in design and enemy location. The Minus World is actually part of a larger existence of levels. Super Mario Bros. actually has 256 worlds, and every world past World 8 is a random glitched mess that pulls assets from other parts of the game. The Minus World itself is actually World 36 in the game. These extra worlds sparked a rumor in Japan where a lightning strike caused a Nintendo system to show a Mario level never seen before, thought to be a part of a secret World 9. Nintendo referenced these rumors by actually featuring a World 9 in Super Mario Bros. 2, known outside of Japan as the Lost Levels, which can be unlocked by beating the game's first eight worlds without using any warp zones. Worlds A, B, C, and D were also included, bringing the Lost Levels count of worlds up to 13, with a total of 52 stages. And as we go into the outside Japan version of Super Mario Bros. 2, let's go into some music trivia. Super Mario Bros. 2's title screen is a sort of jazzy remix of the underwater stage music from Super Mario Bros. 1. Most likely, this remix of the underwater theme was added specifically to try and more closely tie in the game with the Mario franchise. Incidentally, another remix of the underwater theme was then used later for Super Mario Bros. 3's title screen as well. Perhaps the original game's underwater melody was a personal favorite of the development team, as it's often subtly referenced in other games like Melody the Piano playing Ghost in Luigi's Mansion, And 
even add it into the Super Smash Brothers Melee arrangement of Rainbow Cruises theme. The original title screen theme for Super Mario Bros. 2's predecessor, Doki Doki Panic, was actually a quicker arrangement of what the American fans of this game will know as the ending credits theme to it. One pretty interesting thing about Super Mario Bros. 2 is that despite the red design being the iconic representation of the Sniffit enemies, even to the point of them being featured in the game's instruction manual, there was only a single red Sniffit in the whole game. It appears in World 3-3 falling off of ledges as it moves and changing its direction to face the player. And as another little side note to this, later during the N64 stage, 3D Sniffits introduced in Super Mario 64 would use this red colour for their basic design. Also in Mario 64, in the English version of the game, they are called Snuffits, but in the original Japanese version they do share exactly the same name, which actually means that the English name could have been a translation error. Speaking of enemies, the game's Fantos can actually be killed. It's only possible to defeat them with a combination of a stopwatch and a star. If you manage to freeze time, grab a star, then hit the Fanto, it'll die. Touching it while having a star but no stopwatch won't affect it. After destroying a Fanto, however, a new one will take its place if the player enters another room while still carrying a key. Interesting to note as well that despite Super Mario Bros. 2 being outfitted to become a Mario game when it wasn't inherently one in the first place, it's actually where many of the franchise's most recognisable enemies originate from. Were Doki Doki Panic not reconstructed into a Mario game, the likes of Shy Guy, Sniffits, Ninjis, Pidgeots, Bobombs, and even Birdo would not be added into the world of Mario. Looping back around to our mention of the credits, which features the Doki Doki Panic original theme as Mario is drifting away in his sleep, we're treated to a series of images showing each character's name. However, there's a few mistakes in the labelled enemies' names. Claw Grip is misspelled as Clawglip, Triclide is misspelled as Triclide, and Hoopster is misspelled as Hoopstar. Most notably, however, is that Ostro and Birdo's names were swapped on accident. This mistake carried over to the instruction booklet as well, but it's worth noting that two versions of the instruction manual exist, with one including an extra sentence saying, he thinks he is a girl and he spits eggs from his mouth. He'd rather be called Birdetta, clearly referencing the fact that the character's actual name is Birdo. The last thing worth noting about Super Mario Bros. 2 is that the 1989 animated series of the Super Mario Bros. Super Show actually featured a heavy amount of material in reference to Super Mario Bros. 2, including having Mario, Luigi, Toad, and Princess Toadstool star as the four main characters, as well as the majority of henchmen characters being enemies derived from the game. However, Bowser, simply called King Cooper in the series, led an army of baddies comprised of a mix of Super Mario Bros. 1 and 2 characters. Mario 2 bosses Mouser and Triclide were amongst Bowser's right-hand men, despite them normally being underlings of the evil frog Wart. Wart has not actually appeared in any other major Mario games outside of remakes of Super Mario Bros. 2, such as Super Mario All-Stars and Super Mario Advance. Bud makes a cameo in NES Remix 2 for the Wii U as a minigame where you must quickly defeat him in his classic final boss battle. And just before we wrap up part one of this video series, let's have a quick dive into the beginning of Super Mario Bros. 3. Super Mario Bros. 3's visual style is very reminiscent of a stage play. The platforms and environmental objects are all designed to look like set pieces, and the title screen even has a rising curtain and drapes over the left and right sides. Shigeru Miyamoto himself has confirmed that he considers the Mario characters to almost be like a troupe of actors that perform whatever tasks they're called upon, inspired by the cast of characters from his favourite childhood cartoons like Popeye. This is also his explanation as to why in one game Mario could be rescuing the princess from Bowser, while in another game they could all be playing sports and racing go-karts together. The stage play motif has actually been used in other Mario games in the series, like the Paper Mario series, and even most recently in Super Mario 3D World. The battle mode seen in the game's two-player mode is actually in reference to the original Mario Bros. arcade game, where Mario and Luigi must compete against each other in order to win. It even included some of the original enemies, like fighter flies and sidesteppers. And finally, the warp whistles that you can discover scattered throughout the first two worlds actually play a tune that the series composer, Koji Kondo later recycles for the title screen theme in The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time for the N64. Thank you so much for watching and please let us know if we've missed any easter eggs. Please do keep in mind that we haven't quite finished Super Mario Bros. 3 yet, so if there's any easter eggs we've missed from that, it's probably going to be finished off in the next episode. And also we're going to be covering more of the main series Super Mario titles as this video series goes on. So if we've missed any of your favourite easter eggs from the later instalments, we're most probably going to be covering them in the future. And if you're a little bit curious as to what I do on my channel, then you can have a look at that video link in front of you there, which takes you to my top 10 games that I don't like 
think, but everyone else does, so yeah. Don't hate me for that video, mm, sorry.